Today, I'm speaking with Neil Godfrey. Neil, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. And I don't know too much about Neil. I'm looking forward to getting to know him, but I do know a little bit. I know Neil is an Australian. I appreciate you working with me on the time zone difference here. And uh, Neil has uh, a blog called Vridar, V-R-I-D-A-R, where he muses on biblical studies, politics, religion, ethics, human nature, and some tidbits from science. I uh, was looking up a little bit about uh, Neil, and I found that you were a librarian at the National Library Board, which is really cool, and a digital collections coordinator at Charles Darwin University, and you also had studied at the University of Queensland. It, could you tell me, besides being a librarian, have, there, have you had any other positions that you can tell us about? Uh, before I was a librarian, I was a high school teacher. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, but no, I moved into a uh, school uh, librarian, teacher librarianship, and then... Um, from there, I just zoomed out. Yeah, no, and um, I was, yeah, situations in life, you get uh, life changing experiences, you know, family breakup, and so you've got to decide, okay, do I continue where I am or do I move somewhere else? And different yeah. situations. But I went into the academic library, libraries, and uh, no, I've just, it's, it's been a great experience. Yeah. For the physical libraries, are they? really not as useful to people as much because of people doing everything online now? Or do you find some people just always come into the library or has the library shifted more to a digital yeah, base? No, li no, libraries are very much uh, the center now of, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, because of the digital, yeah, and online. Um, well, people aren't I, going like well, physically as much. I don't mean because of COVID, I mean, just like they're going through the computer yeah, into the library. Yeah, uh, that, that's, True, but then there are a lot of resources which, because of licensing um, laws, um, people have to use some database on the campus itself. Uh, there are many of those situations, but um, now I find, well, I go to the uh, University of Queensland Library <coughs> from time to time and I see it's always crowded and it's mostly people with in front of computers. Mm. And I'm quite sure that you're going through databases that are available uh, primarily for students. And I, yeah, um, I use libraries all the time um, online, um, but you mentioned, okay, going in, but yeah, going in, you got special services there. Um, I often have to do that, but I use the libraries all the time. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yep. Well, I, I used to go um, a lot more before the uh, internet was really a, a lot bigger part of our lives, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I admit my, my, I don't know my way around the library as much as I used to, but um Anyway, certainly there's a lot to read one way or the other. I do want to ask, your blog is called Vridar. What does Vridar mean yeah, or stand yeah. for? Okay, Vri I pronounce it Vridar. Vridar, excuse me. Uh, yeah. It comes uh, from uh, novels. Uh, oh, gosh. Just let me go for a moment to find it in your Vardis Fisher, sorry, yeah, Vardis Fisher. Um, I read a series of novels uh, by him, uh, oh, around about late 1990s. Uh, they were introduced to me by Earl Doherty. Yeah. Uh, he spoke about them, and they, uh, Vardis Fisher was an American author, yeah, well known American author back in the uh, 50s, 60s, and um, he also wrote about the Mormon history, the Mormon experience, and I just devoured that because of the comparisons with my own uh, cult experience and what mm -hmm. I knew about the origins of our cult. But uh, the, he had wrote a series called The Testament of Man, and um, he goes through the scholarship of the time and turns it into novels to illustrate how mankind has evolved from, you know, very early, yeah, Stone Age period, and he takes it right through historically, uh, one novel for each uh, period, mm. uh, and concludes with a mammoth uh, two-volume uh, set on his own personal biography. And that just blew me away as, um, mm. because I just felt, I just identified so much with his experience of growing up in the Mormon church, but very strict Mormons, um, the confrontations he had, the difficulties he had with adjusting to the real world because of that, and uh, how he came out of that, broke away from it, and his exploration into how to live, what life is all about. 
Um, yeah, no, I just identified with him in so many ways. And in those novels, uh, he his main character was uh, Vrida. Okay. <laughs> it was, it was a, like an anagram of his own name. His name is Vardis Fisher. Okay. And he turned Vardis into Vrida. Nice. And uh, at the time, I suppose when I started the novel, you know, Vrida, the uh, his own personal, you know, uh, character. Gotcha. I just took that. So it's kind yeah. of a tip of the hat in respect to his work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I just I found myself identifying with him in his novels, and uh, yeah. yeah, they sound fascinating. It's so. For anyone who doesn't know, and I, I do want to go, you know, into some meteor topics later, but just in a in a very overview sense, what is your your website all about? What are you trying to do with it? Uh, share my ideas, really, as just as I explore them. I like to. I was torn actually between two um, thoughts. Yeah, you know? I had a political side as well as religious side. Yeah, you know? politics and religion, all that. Yeah, the ordinary topics, yeah, um, but um, I wanted to write, I was very active uh, politically um, mm. some years back, but I realised there are so many other blogs and uh, websites covering the political side that, and I would only be really duplicating a lot of what they write up, yeah, most of my stuff would be just copying and pasting almost, you know, from what they were saying. But when it came to the religion side, there was nothing else which was uh, showing um, a critical approach to churches without there were those that were tended to have a real uh, personal you know uh, vendetta against religion um, mm. there was a lot of emotion attached to it and I didn't like those but I thought what about just getting down into the real scholarship the scholarly uh, exploration of it all and uh, trying to share this yeah because most people, well, you yourself, you know, when you come out of uh, religion, you begin to discover so many things you didn't know about the Bible, uh, how it came to be, and uh, so on, and what the scholar, uh, scholarship had shown. And it just is not available. People aren't aware of these things. So I wanted to uh, make a lot of that as you know, accessible as possible. Yeah, well, we appreciate you doing it. I, I will admit you, you go very deep with some topics and uh, some that I almost have to have a dictionary, so to speak on the side just to understand everything. But, you know, but there's a, there's a certain level of, of, you know, depth that when you start to get into some of these topics deeper and you, you know, you understand, um, you know, for example, yeah. the, the mystery cults better than just a surface glance. You understand Josephus better than just a surface glance. Some of these, these details, once you get them, you're like, okay, I, I see what, I see what the issues are. I, I, I know more than just the first level and that's what yeah. you get into. And I appreciate that you kind of take us down and work, work us through those things. I can, yeah, every so often I go back and look at the early posts and I realize, yeah, I have changed. I used to be much shorter posts and much more yeah, mm -hmm. direct. But I was really, I suppose, conscious of informing people of certain basic ideas. Um, but the more I've got into it, the more I'm exploring these things for myself, and perhaps that way a lot of it's gotten more into, yeah, more deeply into some of these things. It's my own exploration now, trying yeah. to find out. And as I go into it, I share it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, um, it's probably um, a given, but for anyone who doesn't haven't hasn't been there yet, I'll have a link right beneath our video. So please go check out uh, Neil Godfrey's blog again. Uh, I'm mispronouncing. It's is Vridar. 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 You got me confused now. <laughs> Vridar, Vridar. That's a Vridar, Vridar. Vridar, yeah. okay. So long E, Vridar. And I uh, wanted to also just, before we dive into some, you know, some me meteor topics potentially later on in the, in the hour, I want to just ask about you. Uh, can you tell us about your background? Um, you know, where did you grow up? What was it like, in, especially in terms of religion? And, you know, just what, what's your journey been like? I grew up in a Methodist church. Uh, <clears throat> It was, we were told we were one of the liberal, on the liberal Methodist churches, you know, we actually um, allowed dancing and playing cards, but we wouldn't <laughs> drink. It. So, sinners, uh, sinners. So, yeah, that's right. So we were the liberal wing, you know, there was another group of Methodists who wouldn't even allow those. And we just felt so lucky that we were these liberals. <laughs> was that but, in Australia? Uh, you grew Australia, there? In yeah. Brisbane, Brisbane, yeah, northern suburbs of Brisbane. Okay. And... Um, 
Now, so I grew up, yeah, as a Methodist, and then teenage years, you know, as you do, you go through all sorts of questioning and doubts, and uh, I decided to be, yeah, I, in a very superficial way, become Buddhist, Islam, atheist, everything. But I really was basically a Methodist. I was just feeling my way. But, but then um, I was listening to Garner Ted Armstrong on the radio, the World Tomorrow program. Um, and after a while, that started to sink into me. And I think what attracted me to the uh, Worldwide Church of God was uh, I saw it as getting back to the basics, uh, the, the um, true religion, you know, what the original Christianity was all about. And mm. I suppose it appealed to a certain idealism that I had. And I could see, yeah, what he's saying about um, the hypocrisy, you know, in the ordinary churches, which is just normal people living, really. But I look back now. But uh, to me, I said, look, they're not living exactly the way it should be in the Bible, you know. And uh, mm. so, and there are a lot of other issues that happen to you, you know, going through those early teen years. Um, so I ended up becoming a member of the Worldwide Church of God. Uh, and I I, that, that meant you, you were not just becoming a church member, but you were actually personally believed in, in Jesus at that point as you're saying? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I moved from Methodism and I became a part of this uh, religious, what I would call a religious cult now. Mm. Uh, some people call it Armstrongism. You know, there's a real personality cult in the leader, Herbert Armstrong. And uh, now I was very dedicated to that. Um, that was my life. And my, my whole life really was in that cult. Yeah, everybody, you, you, you cut off your bridges then for, you, you, of, from everyone else, your family. You maintain oh. contacts in your, your family, but they're super, they're, they're tenuous, you know, that's not the same anymore. You don't join in with uh, the activities. You talk differently, you think differently, you avoid, it's very much a process of what cognitive behavior therapy that's really what it's about you call it we call it self-control and learning to live by the spirit <laughs> but really what it comes down to is you're training your own mind you know to think and act in so they're very ways. very sheltering and kind of overprotective in that sense oh yeah 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 very um very strict yeah um mm. it's very it's a, a self-disciplining uh thing yeah you know? you're always striving for perfection you know you try to kid yourself that it's not you who's doing it it's spirit in you that's doing it you know because it's not your works it's god's works in you and it's all faith but then um everything that had been promised you know i thought well here i'm keeping all these laws doing all these things right but then i still had a a failed marriage i thought that shouldn't <laughs> what's going wrong here and i realized so hang on i've never prospered i've Went above, way above and beyond in my tithing. Yeah, we paid uh, two tithe, well, paid one tithe plus generous offerings, always generous offerings on top of our tithe. Tithe was always on the gross, you know, before any tax or anything. And um, then there was a second tithe you kept for your feasts, annual feasts. And then every uh, third year, you pay another tithe for the poor people, mm -hmm. making yourself absolutely destitute in the process. And uh, then you find out later that that third tithe is being used by ministry for their high life and so on. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, I began to see, yeah, th there was a time of uh, changes in the church itself. As, as the leader, Herbert Armstrong, was getting older, there were various criticisms, you know, new views coming out and... Uh, is that headquarter there in Australia or is that another? In, uh, in America, Pasadena, in America, California. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, though we did have our own local headquarters, but primary headquarter was always um, in um, America. Hmm. But anyway, uh, the end of it all was I uh, was questioning how was it, you know, that, okay, I studied the Bible. Um, I know I've read the Bible so many times, you know. Let's try doing something different for a change. I'm going to read each book on its own by itself without any reference to any other book. Genesis. Now, I'm not going to turn flip over quickly to see how Matthew interpreted or 
Yeah. And then I went through everyone just like that. And it just gave me a different, hang on, the Bible doesn't say all these things that we've been taught to say. When you, We were taught uh, in the church that here a little, there a little, you know, you interpret, use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Well, that's rubbish. You interpret a book to interpret the one book. The Bible is just a collection of books. Many of them, yeah, all the variants with one another. Um, so I came to uh, get a more critical understanding of the Bible. I approached the ministers about it and um, they began very, became very suspicious because I could, I used to find myself correcting the ministers, found myself knowing more about the Bible than our ministers did. That's and awesome. thought, yeah. And so um, I thought, hang on, there's something wrong here. And then I began, and then that's right. Now, when Herbert Armstrong died, um, we had a new fellow come in as the pastor general, Joe Tukoc, and he changed everything. Okay, Christmas used to be pagan. Now it's okay to keep Christmas, um, those sorts of things. And now Sabbath is optional. Uh, tithing is not necessary, uh, only if you can afford it, and, and on and on. And I thought, hang on, hang on. We were so grounded in the belief that, Herbert Armstrong was inspired by God. He had all of this information revealed to him by God, and we all proved it from the Bibles. One man comes in, a new regime. Now, all that's out. If you believe that, you're a rebel. You've got to go with the new yeah, teaching. Yeah, you can't. And I thought, this, is, this reminds me of what I learned about Russia. You have uh, Stalin come in. Yeah, this is how it's got to be done. You get shot if you're not a part of it. He's out. Okay, if you keep with Stalin, we're going to shoot you. <laughs> okay, we, and I thought, this is this is this is a total you know ball. This is not this is not that nothing to do with God or God's Holy Spirit. This is just you know. So that's when I yeah. Hmm. Reminds me a lot of the Catholic it, Church it finally, too. It finally, penny finally dropped. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds but, me of the Catholic uh, Church too. They do that yeah. same thing. It's like yeah. Yeah. Vatican, yeah. Vatican II comes along and turns over stuff that's been yeah. dogma yeah. forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So anyway, um, so that was, yeah, but I was still a Christian, uh, still. So what I started to look for were the antecedents of the Worldwide Church of God. You know, I wanted to find the original Church of God that the Armstrong uh, came out of, and I did a bit of searching around. I you stayed with the Sabbath-keeping churches. Um, um, Saturday? Yeah, yeah, I, I did for a while, but then... Um, but I just, I suppose I was on a journey then and I came to question the Sabbath too for some reason. I can't remember exactly the details of that now. But, um, yeah, so, but, I, but I went then to mainstream, back to mainstream churches, yeah, similar to what I had grown up in. Mm. And uh, Church of Christ, uh, Baptist Church, yeah, I took my children along just for the experience also to see a Catholic church. We visited Catholic churches from time to time to get just a different experience. Anglicans. Um, Before you tell us what happened next, could I go back a few steps? When you were growing up in the Methodist Church, were your parents believers, as far as you know? Were they telling you things like this? You are a sinner who's who's deserving of punishment. Therefore, without Christ, you know we all deserve hell. Yeah. And that the idea that no matter how good you are, your good works aren't a part of this. They can never be good enough. That the only thing yeah. that can save you is Jesus's death and resurrection and his, his death is, is in our place and yeah. specifically his, 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 his violent death, his blood, and that by virtue of you identifying with him, you get to receive that as, as if it's applied to you, it's imputed to you as, as, as your righteousness, even though it's not yours, it's Christ on you. Was yeah. that kind of message of, you know, and you had to believe in that to, to receive it. Was that taught to you as a young man? I don't think uh, we were that full on, yeah, as I said, whether perhaps it bought maybe too liberal a Methodist church. It was just the catechism. We just learned okay. the catechism and uh, studied. Um, I don't remember too much, uh, you know, being weighed down heavily. Yeah, there was, uh, no, hang on, I think back, no, there, there were, certainly you do have guilt feelings, yeah, yeah, you got it. Because, um, yeah, your grandma who died recently, she's now in heaven and she's watching, looking down, watching, can she, she can see everything you do, you know. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah. I don't, you mentioned the Baptists uh, later. I know the Baptists tend to be more... Yeah. Yeah. In my experience, it didn't mean we're clear on the, on the, what we would call the yeah. God, true gospel. I, I, yeah, I, I found the Baptists, I suppose when I did visit them, yeah, I found them perhaps a little bit too severe mm -hmm. uh, in some ways. And, yeah, I, yeah, I was 
been looking into it. But by this time, though, the Methodist Church had gone. That was it's now the Uniting Church anyway. So um, yeah, yeah, that's right. I did go to Uniting Church. I think I felt more comfortable there in many ways. Yeah. 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 Do you recall when you were growing up um, praying, and and it, do you do you remember it feeling real, and and having any sense of like you're actually talking to a real person up in heaven who is listening to your prayers? Most of the vivid memories of strong guilt feelings, uh, all of that sort of thing, was during the cult years. Um, because so I really showed it. Worldwide Church of God? Worldwide Church of God, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you see yourself as, yeah, very, as you were saying there, you know, it's Jesus Christ and all that, um, as doing the works, not you. And that, what um, turned me off, what, where I departed Christianity was... Um, thinking through uh faith yeah i think you mentioned praying and um i was praying one day and i suddenly realized hang on i just i'm just praying to the ceiling <laughs> what's going on you know, there's nothing up there but the ceiling there's no god behind the ceiling um well, i didn't quite go that far in my thinking but now the more i thought about it i realized hang on what is it that's empowering me or energizing me to live this way to do all this i thought it's my faith in you know in what, in what jesus has done what god has done through jesus it's my faith in this that's propelling me in all of this yeah why do i become a good person because okay i'm responding to what my faith in god's love for me um so you and then i thought hang on I, if i had the same faith the same belief in an eagle or a rock or some carved image, you know, it would be exactly the same. I would yeah. have the same response. It's, it's, it's my faith that's doing it. It's just my belief. Mm. <laughs> yeah. like, hey, or any oh, other. They're doing that. It's, it's me. It's all coming from in here. Yeah, or and any I, other deity, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, 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 and that began to, yes, put me in a real tailspin then. I thought, oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, what a thing to say at that yeah. moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I'd, uh, heard, that's right. No, I'd been introduced to psychology, uh, listening to radio programs, uh, listening to psychologists discuss belief in God, uh, religious cults and I think, and, uh, I started to understand more about what was going on with me uh, by listening to what these other experts are saying. Hmm. And then I began, when I heard some, someone say, yeah, the psychological reason for believing in God, and, uh, I began to follow that through, and I thought, my gosh, do I, yeah, <laughs> how far do I question these things? And, uh, mm. um, and uh, now then I, yeah, I did come to the point where I thought, why do I believe? Yeah, I've got no reason to believe in God. All of this business about the Bible is a total load of nonsense. Um, and so I prayed my last prayer to God. I looked up and to the ceiling and <laughs> the imaginary figure beyond, and I said, God, if you were there, yeah, and you're, and you're going, if you're going to judge me for being as honest as I possibly can be with all the evidence and understanding I have in front of me, I'm doing, you yeah, know, this is my decision now to not believe in you anymore. <laughs> and if, you, if that makes me worthy of going to hell forever, then I have no respect for you and I'd rather you, yeah, mm. do that. Yeah, so, and I haven't prayed since, so. Yeah, that's such I know it looking back at it now it probably feels like it's just, you know, it's water under the bridge and it's part of your journey. But yeah, that being able to say those things for, for those of us who've been through it, it, it it's so easy now, obviously, on this side of the fence. But when you're in it and it's real, it takes so much oh, bravery yeah. and reflection yeah. I mean, to, to be able to basically say, you know, because we've, we've said all of our you know long, young lives. God is the judge. He's the king. Yeah. He is you know infallible. He knows what's right, and we, we don't question him. We don't want to ever blaspheme, of course. And then to turn it and say, I'm going to be the judge, not of, of God, but just of, of the information that I've got about whether he's even real. I'm going to be the judge. Taking on that, that it feels so, so arrogant and prideful at first, and it almost feels disrespectful. It's like, who am I to say this? But once you go through it, you're like, this, the, the bravery it takes is, is so critical. And once you do it, you're like, this is what we should all be doing. We should all be taking responsibility and, and the empowerment of saying, you know, I am willing to look at these facts honestly, as opposed to just yeah. inheriting them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so hard to do it. It's so hard. I, for oh, a long time, I felt 
I was in a daze. I felt like, yeah, my whole universe had turned upside down, you know. I, was, I, I looked back and I was, hang on, I've just been living in a fairy tale world. It was all a fairy tale and I believed it was real. And mm. now I just felt like I was in the book of Revelation. All the heavens had fallen down and the earth had parted out from under my feet and I was just walking. I had no idea. I had no nowhere to walk. I was just in a lost world. I had no grounding anywhere. So it took a while. I had to decide now, what the hell do I do now? Where do I go from here? You know, all oh, that was, yeah. Was your response to it, uh, not necessarily your, your volitional response, but just was, was the, the overall response in all, at all related to like a de depression or a sadness? I've, I've heard some people say they get really depressed, especially when you, like you mentioned your grandmother, when you realize that the afterlife is probably not real, or or at least it's it's all very much questionable at the very least. I know some people go more to an agnostic agnostic kind of God is love, and yeah. I you know I hope for a good afterlife, but I don't really know what it's like because yeah. the Bible's not really accurate. But a lot of us, like myself at least, we go to I don't think it's probably anything that happens. I think we're probably same thing happens to a turtle or a, or a monkey that ha when they die is what happens to me probably, which is yeah. nothing. Yeah. And that yeah. realization very much upsets a lot of people. D did you feel like it was upsetting or was it just liberating or what was it liberating. like? Liberating. Yeah, yeah, liberating. Um, I suppose I just, no, I remember um, just asking the question, like, what is life? You know, what's it all about? <laughs> and so uh, I was reading a lot, of course. I was reading anthropology, all the different ways people live, but also evolution and uh, and so on. But um, no, I just looked around. I thought, okay, what life? Okay, there's plants, there's vines, you know, that, that's life. And all they do is simply grow up. They look for ways to, yeah, where they can get the best deal, where they can flourish the most, and then they die and they reproduce. But uh, animals, I looked at the lizards you know, around the place, the, um, the birds, you know, animals, you know, uh, and I thought, that's all it is, you know, I just, and I began to see myself as one with all of that. I'm just mm. a bunch of cells like these things, and I'm in the same world as they are. This is not a fairy tale. This is right in front of me now. This is real. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, the idea that there'd be no, no, I just accept it. That's, that's cool. Going to sleep forever is a very nice idea. <laughs> I, I, like still, <laughs> I still struggle with it. I, I, I've heard people, atheists, say that they, they honestly wouldn't want to live forever. Um, I, I always was and still am one of those people that I would have loved to have lived forever. I don't believe we're going to, and I'm certainly w wanting to deal with reality as opposed to fantasy. But if, if I had a button that could say I would live forever, I, I certainly would, would pick it. But. Well, I'm getting a little bit older now, and I can tell you, the older you get, the less that is appealing to you. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. The body's wearing out, and you begin to think, oh, my God, how much longer? <laughs> yeah. Can I ask, you mentioned yeah. evolution. Um, was was your the, the, the theism that you grew up in, or at least that you ended up with at the International Church of, or the Worldwide Church of, of, of God, uh, yeah. did they allow for evolution to be part of the equation, or were they more of a... Well, no, they're very against evolution. They're very much ridiculed in evolution. Okay. So creationists, and, uh, probably 6,000 yeah, to 10,000 years old? Creationists, yeah, yeah. Although we had a, our own little quirky uh, adjustment to it. You know, we interpreted uh, Genesis 1 1 as having a million year gap or something between two verses, you know, or two phrases. Okay. But um, yeah. No, it's, yeah, no, and it was. <sighs> The logic, the reasoning, yeah, I remember having gone through, yeah, while I was in the church, studying the arguments against evolution, the arguments for Bible prophecy and so on and all of this. And that was where I realised, you know, to coming out, looking back, the logical fallacies, you know, I thought, my God, I made a fool of myself, <laughs> you know, repeating all these things to so many people, you know, what an idiot, you know, I didn't understand basic logic. And that, I think that's where Earl Doherty, helped me uh, crystallize a lot, yeah, understanding, um, yeah, how, how to think properly, how to be aware of logical fallacies. Yeah. Mm. I, although it wasn't uh, Earl Doherty that took me away from uh, evolution. I think I'd come away before and then just by reading a lot more about it, getting the other point of view. Yeah, but uh, no, no, it's, yeah, the logic, the circular reasoning, yeah, the fallacious assumptions. Mm. Yeah, I just awesome. didn't see it at the time, yeah. I wasn't meaning to ask about Earl Doherty, but let me, uh, I'll just make a little plug for him. If anyone doesn't have it, the Jesus puzzle, and I think there's a, 
much bigger version of, of this story, but um, tell us what is what does Earl Doherty add to the the discussion of the origins of Christianity since we're on that topic? Yeah, well, I um, as I said, yeah, I become an atheist then. Yeah, I quite yeah, I, I found it all very liberating. Um, um, perhaps too liberating for a while, you know, you seem to react a little bit, then you got to pull back and you think, oh, my God, and I remember I kept, kept, became an atheist. I said, oh, my God, what if I want to murder somebody? I gave up nothing to stop me. <laughs> and I really wanted to murder, murder somebody at the time. <laughs> no, no, that's not that's not how we are, you know. <laughs> and um, but the, So I was still an atheist, you know, uh, very happy, yeah, all learning away. And then I saw Earl Doherty's website, and he was the one who um, was challenging the idea that Jesus had a historical existence. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's going too far. <laughs> I've come so far, but no, no, that, 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 that's ridiculous, you know. And it took a while, and I, I then spent some time uh, going through his website. This is before he had his book. Um, just trying to study. I thought, God, I've been wrong before. Look how wrong I was, yeah, all that, yeah, so many times in the past. I just don't want to, yeah, be it, yeah, make another mistake. And uh, yeah. so I tend to treat, take it at arm's length. But when I did, I tried to really, yeah, think it through and just, and I just held it in a bag. See, I didn't jump into it. I just thought, no, well, okay, it's an interesting idea. Let me think about it some more and uh, read some more about it, what the other views are. Um, mm. And then I began a correspondence with Earl Doherty, uh, seeing him online at different forums. And I saw the way he was, what was it, uh, Crosstalk? It was a Crosstalk forum where a lot of academics Sounds got together. Familiar. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there someone who introduced him and then Earl came on himself. And I found the reaction informative. Um, mm. As we were saying before this interview, yeah, with uh, many of the these professors, they just went straight for the ad hominem jugular, you know? It was just, they just... It was just outright insult, ridicule, and um, and yeah. I just admired Earl's uh, patience and you know willing, calm, you know reasoning with them. There were a few. There's a handful of uh, scholars there though who did um, open up, and they said, "Look, he's got some pretty good ideas. He seems to even understand Greek. You know, he's got some knowledge of Greek." Um, and they were open to it and they questioned him and he responded and there was to and fro and uh, and I could see, yeah, there's a possibility for a genuine discussion here. But the majority, um, their questions were, they were not genuine, you know. It was all just at, uh, rhetorical questions and, uh, you know, you're an idiot um, mm. type of approach. And that taught me a lot about where biblical scholars are coming from. And I think if anything started to open my mind even more towards them, yeah? Though does it, these, it does was it ever, their response, yeah. Does it ever surprise you, just a quick, quick question, or does it ever surprise you that that dynamic really just, it stays so consistent in almost every generation, as far as I can tell from, you know, reading history, but it's like, whatever the consensus is of this generation, usually within a generation or two, it's, it's shifted, you know, the whole Tommy Thompson thing, and even, you know, going back to things like Galileo, you know, what somebody says today that sounds idiotic, yeah. you know, a generation or two later, it sounds either plausible or like it's it's a definite. And it's it's just amazing to me that so many people want to, you know, use the, the current consensus as if it's the consensus. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like you have to think of it as the consensus of not just today, but the consensus that's going to be here in three, two, three generations. And let's, let's keep it all in mind. And you know, there's a lot of crazy ideas that end up being really quite quite accurate on the money, you know, in a lot yeah. of fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, that's right. No, I think, um, well, Doherty is not the first, you know, he's picked up on what others have been saying really ever since biblical studies have become, yeah, yeah. have been a thing, you know, going back to Bao, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. Ben, and um, as I looked into that too, I found that, the question has never been addressed. It's been dismissed. Yeah. And the arguments uh, that were put out, you know, by Bithus back in the you know, early last century or late even 19th, um, were never um, dealt with. They were, yeah, 
they were misrepresented. You know, you compare the two, compare what is being said, compare with the criticism, and you, you can see quite plainly that, no, hang on, that's not fair. That's a mis misinterpretation, and you're attacking a straw man there. And, yeah, and then the ad hominem comes in, and you realise, no, this is a question that's never been, it's always been pushed aside and ignored. Yeah. Being embraced. And even going back like to the church fathers from, from some of the quotes I've seen, even the church fathers early on were attacked and, the, and their response was, was very telling. They would say, why are, you, why are you attacking us? We're saying stuff that's very, very similar to you or to your mystery faith, you know, to your yeah. mystery cult. We're saying yeah. the same stuff. Why are you attacking us? And it's like the, the parallelisms and the, the way that it seems, you know, like they would say, well, Mithra was mythological, Dionysius or whatever. They're all mythology. So, you know, why not, why not at least consider that maybe this is mythology too? And yet, even though the church fathers admitted the parallels were there, yeah. it's yeah. like we're, we just were, the blinders are so thick. Yeah, 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 that's right. So when you, when you began to get into it, and I, I wasn't sure where we'd take this, but um, did that, did that upset you to think, to, to, to say to yourself, Jesus may not have been real, or was were you so aware of you know that atheism was was probably reality that there probably was no God that it you didn't really have a no, it wasn't really a big a deal either way. But I, no, I, I just found it interesting historically uh, because the, well then how did Christianity begin? Yeah, I just as an historical question, um, that's where the interest was. Uh, no, it didn't worry me. It, it was just a Interesting question, yeah. <laughs> but uh, which whichever way it what went, you know, as I said, it took me quite a while to accept uh, Doty, not just on the Jesus, but even on um, uh, some of it. He embraced the uh, Q hypothesis, which is pretty much mainstream in biblical studies, and I had some difficulties, but he very much, you know, went a long way towards persuading me of the Q, you know, of the mainstream biblical point of view on the uh, Q hypothesis and uh, so we had many discussions and you know and I would always be yeah and we'd be testing each other I suppose in some ways and that's where I found yeah he would often respond with uh, logic you know this discussion of logical fallacies and that's where I became much more conscious of uh, trying to be careful with how you think. Well do you mind could I ask do you yeah. mind uh, for anyone who hasn't read again uh, Earl Doherty this is just one of, of uh, at least two books I know of. he's probably read, written more than that but um could you tell us in a you know just a three to five minute nutshell, what is the thesis? What is his 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 idea as to how this Christianity probably got started? I know you probably would have yeah, some yeah. things to change if it was your yeah, your story, yeah. but just what is his story? Uh, his uh, thesis uh, fundamentally is that uh, uh, the Gospels are very late, and uh, they can be explained most simply or most uh, directly as. Uh, rewritings of Old Testament stories. Um, Paul himself read in, you know, without uh, reading through gospel uh, views, just reading on his own uh, um, agenda, is not clear, is not clearly um, pointing to any physical Jesus on earth. Um, he's always or very often talking about a heavenly figure, a figure of revelation. Um, mm. Basically, those are the two, yeah, and yeah, and uh, he believes that uh, Christianity began uh, with uh, Paul or some other early apostles, perhaps through visions, um, uh, making some contact or having some communication with a heavenly Christ, a heavenly Messiah. And uh, he became uh, uh, rewritten eventually in the Gospels as a human figure with a human story that was really largely uh, a matter of analogies based on Old Testament stories. That's basically his idea. That Jesus was a heavenly figure to begin with. So would that be equivalent to the, the concept of like an archangel that Jesus may have began yeah, as an archangel? Similar, got... similar, similar, similar. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I've, yeah, no, I've... Yeah, some of the evidence that's being advanced for that um, comes from the Ascension of Isaiah, an early Christian uh, text, which uh, in its present form allows uh, the idea of, oh, there's a little gap in there. Jesus comes down from heaven and there seems to be some corruption in the text and you can interpret that in a number of ways. And 
Mm. No, I, I, uh, I haven't got, haven't been completely on board with Doherty on, on uh, that or carrier okay. carrier followers the, the same. Yeah, no, I, I tend to think that that's where Jesus slipped down to earth and uh, had himself crucified. He may have only been here for a few hours or days or whatever. Yeah, time is irrelevant just for the right. sake of being crucified and then did his job down to hell, back up heaven again. You mentioned the, the ascension of Isaiah. Have you uh, had any um, exposure in your research to the book of Enoch and what that contributes to this discussion? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you learn from that book? Um, the, the Jesus, um, or the, not the Jesus, but the Son of Man figure um, is evolving. You can see how it began in the book of Daniel as a metaphor yeah, because Daniel talks about all these beasts, four beasts, each beast representing an empire. Then he comes to a man. Um, that man represents the kingdom of God uh, compared to the beast. Yeah, this is the, yeah, the humanist <laughs> type uh, kingdom. Got a human heart. So this is, and it's clearly a metaphor. He even says that, you know, if, uh, this is where the saints are all delivered and so on. Um, now, um, what Daniel has done is taken a passage from Isaiah, apparently, he's, and uh, he's worked that, it worked the suffering, yes, as I spoke about the suffering servant, and Daniel has uh, taken this idea of a suffering uh, servant, yeah, this son of man comes in, yeah, he represents the blood of the saints, you know, those who are suffering, his servants, and he resurrects them all. You know, doesn't res he establishes a new kingdom uh, with them. Mm. And uh, it's all symbolic. But then by the time you get to Enoch, Enoch takes the son of man and he sees him and he's made him into a real figure. You know, someone who's actually in heaven. And, uh, and Enoch kind of gets taken up to different levels. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. It becomes more real. To go um, through yeah, similar to the way the Gospels, I think, uh, you can see in the Gospels, you know, in Mark, Gospel of Mark, to me, it's very clearly a, uh, a, a, symbol, a symbolic story. You know, you look at it carefully, nothing makes sense there, you know. Um, I can talk about that later, but this, you know, it's, it's a nonsense story, you know. Um, Jesus telling people, keep the secret from the crowds, and the crowds are all around him, and so on, it's a, it's a sort of thing. Well, I thought no author in their right mind would write something as crude as that. And apologists will say, oh, but you've got to imagine. You know, you've got to create another story to put in there to make it work. Yeah. But uh, it, that's a purely, uh, it, it's an imaginary story. Then it becomes more realistic. Uh, you know, the later evangelists say, yeah. A bit more they smooth away some of the obvious artificialities and they create a more realistic human being and yeah give him a birth story very real. <laughs> now jesus is very real like with enoch yeah jesus yeah enoch or yeah whoever wrote that took the son of man yeah well enoch actually he i think didn't he go up through heaven and become the son of man himself i, I think yeah. so yeah, the, the, the yeah, meta, yeah. I, yeah. I i don't know the the full story i know um I know some of it, but it was is he either became the son of man or Metatron. I don't know if that's if that's yeah, different yeah. or the same. Not or... Metatron. No, no, it's not. Metatron is no, somewhere else, I believe. But uh, yeah, okay. no, it's not. Yeah, become son of yeah, become. Which in some ways is similar. You think about it to the Christian story. Yeah, it's Paul talks about becoming Christ. Yeah, becoming one in Christ. Yeah, we grow into Christ. So yeah. in some ways, it's a similar similar thought pattern there. Yeah. Quick question here. This is a, more of a silly question, but with all these visions that we're talking about. Do you think there's any possibility that they were using, uh, you know, some kind of mushrooms or something to have these? Or do you think they were just, you, no know, bringing, you know, I don't know, depriving yourself of food long enough or doing something to bring on some kind of enhanced state to do this? Or do you think they were just making it up? Um, I'm just quite your, sure. Your best yeah, guess. See ya. <laughs> I'm quite sure. It's just see ya. It's a, you can see they're uh, working with a very long tradition, literary tradition, and they're very much engaged with that. The words, the literary tradition. So I think there's a lot of sincerity there. And yeah, I think fasting, uh, yeah, certain, you know, putting the body through certain rigors can promote um, hallucinations, certainly. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know about the drug side. Yeah, I've just gotten, 
I mean, I've read Allegro and uh, others, but uh, no, I've just, I just don't think there's any way of knowing that. Yeah, I'm just getting into uh, Allegro's work even this week, but um, yeah, it's a lot of. It, I see both sides of it. Um, sometimes it seems like it's a it's a given that they must use something, but uh, it's I, I honestly don't know enough about all the ways people ha have induced hallucinations and things like that. So yeah, no, I, I just wonder. There's a bit of circular logic there. You know, they you know, can see the parallels. But which one came first? You know, what's interpreting from what? You know, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. Could I ask? Do you in your um, studies have you dove much into the whole? context of the Qumran community, the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you know, the Essenes, the Ebionites. Can you share anything you've, you've learned uh, in your journey as, in studying all that about how that might have impacted how yeah. that early Christianity worked with early Judas, you know, those different Judaistic uh, groups? My, my thing is that from what I've been able to understand of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, there's so many, you know, there's so many different interpretations, different ideas, and uh, I see them as belonging to very much the, um, perhaps the BC era, um, before, but I don't see any connection between the people who were there, if they were indeed a group, you know, some people would say that uh, that was a library collection and there was no particular uh, scenic group itself uh, as such. Um, but I don't see any connection between them. I see similar ideas, no, but yeah, ideas, but I don't see, I see Christianity is developing later. It yeah. comes on the same later. And there might be, uh, yeah, some of the ideas that you see there are found in Christianity, but I don't know if, the, I don't know if we have any evidence of a link. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting to me on that note to think about, like, the, the, the things I read and some of the videos I watch, they'll, they'll make an, uh, a judgment call, like, you know, it, it seems likely that Jesus was an Essene yeah. or Jesus was a Pharisee. And it yeah. almost seems like what you're seeing is more of, um, and this is just my off-the-cuff interpretation of it, it seems more like it's somebody that's aware of these different groups and bringing in maybe what they want to of their stories to 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 tell their own story or to make a point or to create an argument um but it's like you know when you when you have a guy who you know is, is kind of like an essene but he's also kind of like a pharisee and he's also you know from what i understand uh, you know very heavily in in, in the story heavily influenced by the zodiac you know especially in mark um, the zodiacs all through mark and then you get into you know luke and, and acts and you're getting the homeric stuff it's like whoever's doing this is, is almost like picking different sources, but not necessarily giving you a, a, like a hint, hint, he, he's an Essene, see, he was a Pharisee, because they're picking different pieces that don't fit together. And it almost seems like they're, they're aware of all these puzzle pieces and creating their own new picture with the puzzle pieces. Not that necessarily he was, he was one of these different people, but that he was, you know, the, the storyteller that wove this story together was just aware of all the different stories that, you know, this group said this, this group said that. I don't know what, I mean, do you have any sense as to who was doing all this? Who was actually crafting these stories? Because, I mean, I I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, the, the Alexandrian library, um, yeah, okay. just so many different pieces, you know, the astrotheology, the Homeric epics woven in, other, you know, the, the Neoplatonism. There's like so many little pieces, like who would, and then, but obviously very heavily in, into the, you know, the yeah. Old Testament and even in Gematria. Um, yeah, um, actually, I'm, one book I'm reading right now so is this uh, a French uh, scholar. Can you see that? Yeah, it's uh, right. by Nanine Charbonnel. Nanine Charbonnel. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's. Could you hold it up to the mirror, to the camera yeah. one more time? Oh, camera, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Is that better? Yep. Nanine Charbonnel. Very cool. Okay. Um, and. I just completed a post uh, on a section of that book uh, earlier this morning, and I can see the next part is where she's going to talk about Jesus as a Messiah who incorporates many different views of the Messiah. Mm. So I'm looking forward to going into that part, that, which seems to relate to what you were saying there, that, that you have many different type, yeah, uh, views of what the Messiah might be or do. And... Um, it appears what she's about to argue is that uh, Jesus embodies many of those different ideas. Yeah, now I see um, 
Christianity is something that really is um, responding yeah, to the events of 70, the, the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm. So that sets it all very late, yeah, much later than anything in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the people who are responding then um, concerned to maintain, you know, they're looking at all the traditions, you know, all of the writings, the different, you know, conflicting views in their heritage. And they're wondering, what now? Where are we now? Yeah, the temple doesn't exist anymore. Um, many of us are slaves. Uh, mm. uh, and there's, a, you know, it's, there's a, you know, they're, they're having to respond to that. And so they're looking back on um, the heritage, they're pulling out much of what that has been written in the past in the scriptures and other writings based on the scriptures and uh, trying mm. to create something afresh, anew, which is going to put, wrap all of this heritage up in a new bundle. Yeah. Do you have any uh, guesses or, or, or inklings about whether or not the Romans may have been involved in I, pushing I, I, some I, of that? I can't see that. No, I can't see that. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, now if you can have some specific idea, I'd like to, yeah, happy to discuss. But um, to me, the, the Romans, uh, well, Christianity simply was um, not very welcome. Uh, yeah. You know, the Roman, you know, the earlier, earliest records we have uh, indicate that Christianity, you know, was not all that welcome. Um, uh, I just don't see it. You know, if the Romans are trying to uh, promote it or in, invent it. Then yeah, I've heard some people talk about the idea and I'm not sure I'm not advocating or not advocating, just, um, you know, bringing up ideas, but I've heard people talk about how there, there were so many, you know, struggles, wars, you know, the Romans, you know, like to keep, um, you know, their, their, their peace, they, they invade, but then create a peaceful environment. And they just, they couldn't stop these uprisings. They couldn't stop the, the infighting. Um, yeah. So many things, you know, with the Maccabees. And it was like, enough already. Let's, let's shut this thing down. Let's get this place under control. They wanted peace, and, and they couldn't get it. No matter what they did, it was it was it was just a mess. And the idea of if if they could create an environment where they could have this 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 mastermind, this messiah, this this hero figure that actually said, "Hey, pay Rome what is due to them. Pay God what's due to God. Um, you know, honor the the the, the authorities because God placed them there. You know, if someone yeah. slaps on your face, you know, turn to him the other cheek." And the idea of this this pacifist Christ that would kind of give people this this reason to to um, to basically say, you know what, our fight is not against Rome. Rome is not the enemy. The enemy is anyone who doesn't, you know, accept the gospel. The enemy is our sin nature. Do you, do you see any possibility that that's got some 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 you know pull to it? No, no. Um, for a start, the Maccabees were uh, rebelling against the uh, Syrians uh, long before Rome, or shortly before Rome. Um, Tiberius, a Roman historian, um, I think the uh, late first, early second century, uh, writing about the time of Tiberius, the time of Jesus, said in Palestine, all was quiet. Um, no, no disturbances. Uh, Josephus talks about bandits and robbers, from, yeah, and uh, but they were all over the empire. You had those all, yeah, everywhere. Uh, Britain, you had uprisings there um, mm. and wars. Uh, yeah, the, the the Brits were a real pain in the in the neck too for the Romans. Um, but but no, they were crushed. Um, and the, the there was no uh, series of constant rebellions against Rome in Judea. Uh, in the first century, uh, there was a breakdown in uh, racial tensions uh, mm. where Roman authorities on the scene did not redress you know, injustices properly and the locals you know, took it out on the Romans themselves and made some horrible mistakes like uh, attacking the Roman army <laughs> uh, as they were retreating, you know. Taking, taking their band, you know, their um, wagons and so on, their supply wagons. Um, well, that had to all be put down. That you know, there, there were isolate, you know, there were groups like that. Once they got out of control, okay, the Romans had to come in, but there was no mass uprising. The whole country wasn't. You know, there was just a few places 
you know, a few hotheads that had to be put down and they all sheltered in Jerusalem and, Jer and then they basically took control of Jerusalem and those people in Jerusalem who wanted to have peace with the Romans were outvoted or outshouted. Um, and so Rome had no choice but to simply wait patiently and, you know, build up their siege equipment and uh, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was not a mass uprising. Um, there were a lot of operations where uh, uh, Vespasian uh, would uh, uh, he'd handle a few local uh, incidents where people had had, had rumours, OK, these people are not with you, OK, go and get them, and the people would run away and the Romans would chase after them and slaughter them. And, but that wasn't a fight. There wasn't a challenge. There was no yeah, hmm. Jewish uh, challenge against the uh, Romans. Okay. Um, and, and and the bandits that um, Josephus speaks about were local bandits who were pretty much common fare all around the empire. You, know, you have pirates, you have bandits everywhere. I mean, you didn't have the same strict you know, law and order. And there's nothing in Josephus to suggest that these were messianic figures. Uh, he doesn't use the word Messiah. Um, okay, people say this because, oh, he didn't um, want to upset Roman sensibilities. Um, but he could have, uh, but he was quite happy to use uh, the word prophets and he had nothing but good, uh, uh, bad to say about uh, false prophets, yeah, people who were opposed to the system. He mm. could have easily you know, said, look, okay, we don't like the, these messianic pretenders, you know, and that, that wouldn't have upset the Romans. Um, so there were a, a few in the late 60s, uh, there were some... Um, uh, demonstrations of some kind. You have uh, Thaddeus, you have people, you know, walking up to a mountain, uh, trying to cross the Jordan River, that sort of thing, or being told that the waters would pass. But you can't call those mass uprisings against Rome that are causing a big headache for the empire. You know, those are the sorts of things that were handled quite easily on a local scale, as it says, as Josephus said, you know, um, the Roman, yeah. Figure he just simply stand out his army, yeah, chop them down, okay, no problem, move on, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing to worry about. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I will admit I'm, I'm I'm working through some of the different books. I I feel like there's so many different pieces, and I know we talked about it before, but there's so many little pieces that that you. I, I just I, I definitely want to dive in deeper, and I was just speaking with uh, Ralph Ellis about yeah. uh, Odessa uh, a few days ago, and I, I I feel like there's just so much I need to get more acquainted with, but I appreciate your perspectives yeah. on the on the Roman provenance question and um, yeah I definitely want to dive deeper into what was going on because I mean like you said Jose what Josephus says the, the, the history like you can't understand no matter where you land with interpreting it I think we can all agree you cannot understand Christianity properly without understanding that dynamic of what was going on you know in the hundred years up to yeah. up to Christ I think well the war itself yeah I don't want to downplay yeah the effect of the war with Rome that that certainly was traumatic um, but it wasn't the result of a long series of built-up tensions over years. You know, this, uh, yeah, that's simply, there's no evidence for that, you know. The local governors, Roman governors, Pilate had a wonderful way. He had, he had no problem uh, suppressing any uh, would-be rebels. He'd simply send out the goons, you know, dressed in civilian clothes, the swords hidden at the signal. Okay, stab everyone who's not with us. You know? There's no need to call in Caesar for that. Yeah. He, had, he had it all under control. Yeah. Well, speaking of Pilate, and I, I, I'm, I didn't mean to necessarily touch on so many topics so um, quickly here, but this is this is kind of fun. It's a little different than what I usually do. But um, I, I, if, if you're okay with that, I'm just going to keep asking you some questions. But you mentioned Pilate. And it brings to mind this question of the, the time shift. Some people have, have advocated the idea that some of the pieces of this story don't fit unless we shift the, the timing of what we understand traditionally as, as to when this happened. Have you uh, had a chance to, to, to look at some of that research and do you have any impressions of whether or not there's, there's a, a, a rationale that it's worth considering here to, to consider whether or not this might have happened much closer, like Christianity, uh, the Jesus story might have happened much closer to uh, 270 AD? I certainly think Christianity happened closer to 70 AD, but I don't uh, No, I have difficulties with the time shift uh, thesis. Um, okay. I, mean, I just see it as unnecessarily complicated and 
there are other explanations which, yeah, are more straightforward, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Josephus talks about some of these events, but we don't know very much about them. We don't have any external uh, evidence uh, to give us an insight to how to read what he's saying on some of those things. Can you, could I ask this? Just, just taking what he says here. Sorry. You mentioned Josephus. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm learning from some people that are, are, are much more educated in these topics than I am, the, the idea that in, in the New Testament and, and potentially, um, you know, a lot of other places around that time frame, in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, and other books, there was a need to, to mask the identities of people. And so they would speak of somebody, but they're actually, they were somebody else. And some people have advocated that, that like the reason that we don't have you know, any really good historical proof for the, the existence of Jesus or even for the Apostle yeah, Paul yeah, yeah. is that they, that they were someone else. And I've, I've recently heard some people say that, that Josephus probably yeah. was the Apostle Paul. Do yeah, you yeah. have any thoughts on whether that's what's too going on here? That... I like to keep it simple. <laughs> too complicated right. for me. Um, yeah, to me, that seems to be yeah, just, just too complex. Um, to me, but do you see the parallels, well, like with Josephus, I, I think, for example? I, I the... the parallels, yeah. But uh, there's a simple explanation, not as though there was some sort of cover up or, you know, disguises, you know, uh, trying to lead false clues. No, no. Um, the people who are writing the early Christian literature, they used the works of Josephus. Uh, they drew on what he had written. And they, yeah. You know, um, as they did not just Josephus, but other writings as well. And uh, uh, what was I going to say there? No, but the, the, uh, the names, uh, for example, one that does come up in that respect is uh, the names uh, James, Simon, John, yeah, the names of the yeah, leading apostles. And they, come, they are very prominent in Josephus too and in, in the rebellion. Okay, well, and the, I know you talk, some people have various Jesuses as um, being a, the real historical Jesus. Jesus in Josephus being the real Jesus. But again, I think the simple explanation is that the people who were writing about Jesus in the Gospels were aware of all this literature and they used some of the ideas from there as models or as templates yeah, to write yeah, what they were writing, which is based on the Bible, really, you know, trying to rewrite much of the Old Testament and that incorporate uh, some of these things from Josephus to flesh it out, to make it look more real, like a human being here now. Um, for example, um, the Jose uh, Josephus talks about Jesus of Ananias, um, who is a madman who went around saying, woe to Jerusalem, woe to Jerusalem, and so on, and then finally got hit on the rock, yeah, by a Roman catapult. And uh, as you can see, so many interesting, very real parallels there. Um, he was taken to the Roman governor, was dismissed as mad and so on. Um, and, but what, okay, I, I can see then the gospel, the evangelists simply taking those, oh, yeah, that's a good way to put it, you know, and using those ideas to fill out their own story of Jesus. Um, same with uh, Simon, John, James, you know, these people in Josephus. These were the rebels, the leaders of the rebellion. Um, who are some, okay, we've got to choose some good names now for these disciples. Um, why not, okay, take these rebels who brought the destruction of Jerusalem upon everyone and uh, make them foils in our new uh, story. Um, and they can become the leading apostles of the new kingdom, okay? Show them as the good guys or make them foils. This is how it should have been done. Um, mm. To me, yeah, writers using Josephus, uh, using um, Enoch, Book of Enoch, Daniel, others, you know, they're putting this all together to create a new story that came out in the gospels. Do you, can it, on that note, do you, like, it, it seems like what we're talking about, though, is they're, they're making up a guy. They're making up a story. Like, at what point do you think that they, at what generation of this, or where, where did the story change to say this was historical? 
because at some point they said, you know, obviously at some point the church officially said this was historical, this really happened, there was a Jesus, there were 12 apostles, it happened, you know, everything happened as it was written. It, it seems like the more that I, I understand of, of the history of all this, that it's like the original people were using it as, as, a, as a literary character, as a literary device, like they, they knew it wasn't yeah. real. But I mean, we, I know we're, we're, we're looking at yeah, it histor yeah, yeah. historically the way we see history today. And I can't, I don't want to yeah. mix that up, but just that they, they knew that yeah. they, that they weren't talking about a guy that literally walked, you know, in, on the, on the water that walked in the, you know, was around preaching around the Galilee. They knew that yeah. this was, this was yeah. ma made up, so to speak, the way we would yeah. use it. And, yeah. and then it changed. Like, what do you think, why, like, why do you think it, it did change? Why do you think they did? Like, do you think they trick people? Yeah. This, I don't this, any no, I don't see any trick involved. I don't see any conspiracy, no tricks. Um, what do you think the first generation knew it wasn't real? Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly uh, the author of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, uh, it's clearly um, a parable story. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, you know, there's, you just go through it and nothing makes sense if you stop and think about, you know, what he's actually describing there, how these things happened. Uh, I think it was misunderstanding, basically. Uh these, whoever's writing these uh, go, uh, gospels, was very were very uh, entrenched in the Jewish um, storytelling techniques. Uh, you see that throughout the Old Testament, uh, the same stories are often repeated in different ways, or you know, with variations, uh, and with the motifs of one story are taken and put in another story, quite different but you can see the patterns uh, through the yeah. Old Testament. Um, and when it came then to the events of, you know, the collapse of Jerusalem, uh, is it the same thing happened? Okay, we're taking all of these, uh, you know, stories in the past and want to create, you know, recreate them for our own time, our new situation. And instead of, you know, now we've lost the physical temple, let's have a spiritual temple, okay, and it's got to be Israel. Israel has to be reborn. Uh, this is all in, in the Messiah. Uh, this is all Jewish uh, thinking, Jewish writing, but you include a lot of Gentiles in the same, uh, and it doesn't take very much, yeah, for that writing, that those Jewish uh, stories to become read lit and, and interpreted literally. And uh, with the various divisions you have and so on, I just think uh, many people just assumed or, or read them, understood them literally hmm. uh, from the very early days. We don't have any records of where that when, when, when that happened. We don't even know when the Gospels were written. It yeah. uh, could be anywhere between 70 and uh, 170. There's a, almost a 100-year gap there, yeah, a span in which that could have been written. Yeah. Uh, and the first time we hear of them being discussed as realistic literature, it seems to be in um, uh, Justin Martyr's uh, writings, but he doesn't refer to the gospel. He refers to the uh, memoirs of the apostles, which some people have taken to mean, you refer to our gospels. Uh, that's debatable, I think. Um, and we don't, and I have, a, I wonder too how reliable our dating for Justin is. He wrote a letter to a certain emperor, okay, so he and he spoke of a recent rebellion that was referring to Barcoba's rebellion, 135. Okay, so it appears he wrote, yeah, about the middle of the second century. But from what we know of so many other writings, those, we don't know if those are fictions put in there for a reason. Yeah, maybe as much later. Um, mm. We just don't, you know, there's, there's no, we don't... All the knowledge is tentative, basically. So I yeah. assume Justin is writing in the mid-second century, but I'm always open to the possibility that, hang on, he could be much later even. Um, yeah, yeah. interpolations. And, and he, is, he is just as, right, speaking about the Gospels as real-life events, but he's always talking about, uh, he's always proving them by referring to the prophecies in the Old Testament. Here's mm. the proof that it really happened. Okay, it was prophesied, this, and this is what happened. This is what we read, you know, what Jesus did. And uh, so the earliest Christian evidence outside the gospel seems to be interpreting them literally, but the gospels themselves, yeah, 
you looked at, at the way they are written, it seems to be that some of that is lost on the first interpreter. Yeah. So we have here a set of Jewish writings, but Justin is not reading them in the, quite the way that scholars can now understand how they were written. Yeah, and not to take too many steps backwards, but just to go back for one second, we're, we're, you're saying Paul probably did not see Jesus as a yeah. physical person. He probably saw him only as a yeah. spiritual being. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm open to the idea that Paul did actually think that Jesus did come on earth. I know that's going to upset a lot of uh, uh, people. But uh, now I see he saw Jesus as primarily a spiritual being, um, heavenly entity. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when he was somehow popped out of a woman's body somehow, whether it was by osmosis, we don't know. Anyway, he uh, um, and he oh. died and then back up to heaven. But now I'm quite happy to believe that, yeah, I think that Paul understood all that happened on earth. Um, and uh, I think some of the arguments that Paul is putting all of that in heaven are perhaps unnecessarily complicated. The simple, simplest way is, okay, no, he popped down here on earth for that time and then that was it. But, um, uh, yeah, so, I, but he had no idea of the life of Jesus. He had the idea of gospel, Jesus performing miracles. There was none of that in any of his writings. Yeah, so, parables and all that. Yeah, you know, to him, the Jesus event was simply an event somewhere in the past, there's, there's no time frame for it. It's simply an event. Yeah. So it could have been revealed by a vision. It seems like the more that I learn about like the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm -hmm. Paul really is, he's like such an enigmatic character in this sense. That he, the more that I learn about him, he seems, and I mean, not that I have a, a bone in the fight, but just the idea that he seems like a bad guy. Like he was obviously at the beginning persecuting some, some people who were obviously, yeah. um, you know, I don't know if he was persecuting the, 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 you know, the, the Essenes with, with James, the Ebionites, or yeah. if it was someone else, but he was persecuting some people. And then when he finally, you know, gets involved in it, he gets this, 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 this idea that he's the great liar. He's the great deceiver. And he keeps on saying all throughout his epistles, I, you know, I say this and I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. And it's like, you, you can kind of read through the, in between the lines that he's, he's being accused of being a liar. And it does make you wonder, you know, if, if you, you know, protest too much, maybe there's something to this and yeah. maybe you really are yeah. a liar. And I don't yeah. know, it just seems like he's got more of a yeah. negative connotation than we've understood as, especially as Christians. Yeah. I think that some of the links there might be, you can overdo them a bit. Um, okay. There's the, uh, a senior idea or the uh, Dead Sea Scroll idea about, you know, the liar, but I don't know if there's any, evidence to link that with Paul. I mean, it's supposition. Right. And Paul, he, Paul only talks about, okay, defending himself. You know, I think that's only the once in one letter. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's a very strong reason to connect. In fact, yeah, I'm, may not be him. I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not even sure that there was a Paul as a, as a figure anyway. Um, hmm. uh, no, I, I suspect sometimes that, uh, whoever was producing the letters of Paul was something of a school, like, perhaps like a school who uh, produced some of the uh, Gospels. Someone was producing various letters uh, yeah. in Paul's name, and, and they were as much a fiction as the Gospels. Um, they were perhaps you know, even rewriting scriptures. This might have been a pre-Gospel uh, version of Christianity, hmm. uh, where you know, a replacement of the physical temple, is now in Jesus. You are the now the temple of God. You know the people themselves, the, yeah. the converts, and uh, yeah, and and he, he, some of his letters uh, do appear to be rewritten scriptures. Yeah, even where he's being very emotional and says, "Oh, how yeah, how dare you Galatians be so stupid?" But then you can see the same patterns of rhetoric in Jeremiah. Whoever's writing this is yeah doing a Jeremiah here. Yeah. Uh, it's not, not a genuine person, yeah, expressing their genuine feelings. It's some it's an author um, creating an, an author. Right. Might, yeah, so, uh, yeah. And uh, and Paul, was, yeah, the name itself, Paul, uh, small, yeah, from Saul, yes, yeah, is the new kingdom, the harbour, having care of the uh, new kingdom. So, yeah. Mm. 
Now, I, I see a lot of, uh, yes, some parallels there that it would make, make me think that Paul himself could be a, uh, a, a, a literary figure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I uh, want to shift gears a little bit. I, I, again, I appreciate you being willing to take all these little barrages of questions, but one of the most um, fascinating subjects to me that I just, I love to dive into, and I, I think you've dove into it at least a little bit, is uh, astrotheology. Um, I, I've seen you've, you've touched on Acharya's work a little bit, at least uh, you've mentioned her on a, on a blog post once. Um, have you dove into that much? And uh, just if, if you could, for anyone who doesn't know what that is and who doesn't uh, know what that has to do with, with the Bible, especially with the New Testament, could you just give a brief overview of what astrotheology is and whether or not you see it as part of the, the narrative? I'm not sure I'm the best person to do to give an overview of it because uh, it's such a long time since I looked into it. Sure. Uh, I had many discussions with some of the people involved with it. Um, yeah, I did look into it. I even uh, managed to get a quite expensive secondhand copy of uh, Ptolemy's uh, works on astronomy. Wow. The time to uh, go in and compare what was being you know, written and understood at those times. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, it's again, it's un, it seems to me unnecessarily complicated. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not the best person to describe it. I, my understanding, if I try to describe it, I think I'm going to be. <laughs> well, let me let me paint this way. I, I was just speaking with Bill Darlison, who is um, yeah, yeah. He, he wrote the book the oh, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the Zodiac and the Gospels, yeah, um, yeah. And a couple others that are related, yeah. and it's the idea that when you when you look at the stories, and then yeah. you look at the Zodiac that the, the Zodiac is in the Gospels, especially Mark, and not just yeah. in there, but but yeah. in there in the right order. And that yeah. they're, 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 they're telling star stories. Not It's not clear to me necessarily why they're doing it, yeah. but just the okay. idea of like the Zodiac meant so much to me. I mean, you see it even in the, in the Jewish synagogues that day, this, yeah. you know, you know, tiled, you know, tiled yeah. Uh, yeah. Zodiacs in their synagogue floors. This, it's like the Zodiac meant so much to them. And so it's like, is this just a big star story? Not to be zeitgeisty yeah. about it, but just yeah. it makes you wonder. Yeah. Now, the difficult when you look at those parallels, you know, that are put out there, um, it just seems to lead to many more questions than it answers because there's so many other things in the Gospels which don't seem to fit in with that. Yeah. How do you explain those? And some of the details that do match seem to be very slender compared with others, which are very strong. And so, um, yeah, I just wonder if there was an astro, if there's some sort of astrological uh, theme to it all, that there'd be more, that what we'd be reading would be different from what it is now. To me, when I yeah, see, I, I can see a lot more link uh, directly to uh, the Old Testament scriptures. Hmm. I can see, I can explain just about everything in the Gospels by comparing it there. And perhaps uh, the zodiacal, the zodiac idea, um, that's been a part of, you know, the cultures and maybe the feasts might have, you know, revolved around certain, you know, they revolved around certain seasons. Um, so there's this is going to be, you know, some overlap there between what you see in the stars, but whether the evangelists were writing that consciously into the gospels, I find that, yeah, I just yeah. see that as opening more questions than it answering. I think the thing that fascinates me about it, and I don't have any answers either, but the thing that fascinates me is just it, it invites you into a different mindset. Like literally you think yeah. about in, like in the Enochian concept and the, even the just the Greek, um, you know, dualistic sense. Like you think about they weren't seeing like levels of heaven as if it was some kind of just an imaginary, imaginary world. They're they're like looking up at night at the stars, and they're like, that's the one level, and that's the nub of the level. And if you could see beyond that one that we can see there, that's the next levels above it. They're like they're physically seeing like levels of heaven above us, and they're they're potentially you know if if Dr. Carrier is correct, you know they're they're seeing you know Jesus was crucified up there, and you know Adam was you know was buried there, and. Like they're 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 literally attributing all these spiritual things to something very physical that they could see or or, or close to see, and just the, the the space space and stars and the planets and the sun and the moon the zodiac the equinoxes it meant so much more to them 
than it means to us today. I mean, some of us can't even see it because of the light pollution, you know, and it's like, if we could just see the stars, it feels like it would give us a better appreciation of, you know, that they were, this meant, I'm not sure what all it meant to it, but I, I know it meant a lot more to them than it does to us and to even what we can grasp. And I, I kind of, it's kind of cool. I, I don't know what to think of it yet myself, but it's kind of cool how much, how much of space they wove in either that they could physically see or that they wove into their visions with Enoch and the, the, the levels of heaven. And especially as it, as it, as it parallels a lot of the, the Greek, you know, Neoplatonism. And I just, I find it a fascinating study. I, I really look forward to diving deeper into that and just figuring out what, what they may have been thinking about. Yeah. I, I just think, yeah, um, yeah, I can understand, you know, inter- putting in a lot of those thoughts, you know, try to interpret what we see you know, through that, model but um i'd like to see more direct evidence in the literature which supports that um i see a lot of yeah a man yeah okay possible interpretations of the literature that way but i don't see the literature at many points coming out and telling us this is what you should be reading i was curious Mm. at this point to to kind of Bring it back to your story um, again. There's so many topics I, I could and, and would love to bring up with you, but I know our time is 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 getting short here. But I wanted to ask uh, to bring it back to kind of wrap it up here with a more personal focus. You obviously came out of of, of the Christian faith, um, a particular subset, you know, per, perhaps. Uh, you, but you'd call it a cult, just like I would have called my uh, Presbyterian uh, background, you know, Calvinistic background, a cult, even though we would have never called it that when we were in it. But I, I wanted to ask to dive a little bit into the uh, two questions, basically. The first one is, now that you're where you are, you've been through a lot, you've obviously stepped back from the edge, you're, you're, you're more academic now, you're not, you know, you're not trying to respond to, to, you know, what it did to you. You're just looking at it more academically, but from where you are today, do you think that religion is a good thing? Um, in this world, or do you think, you know, if, if you had a way to to move us toward, you know, getting out of religion, would you would you want that for us? And like, what do you think? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> to me, is religion a good thing? It's like saying, you know, is um, a rock a good thing? <laughs> it's, it's just there. <laughs> um, it's how it's human. It's human. Um, I think a lot of people need religion. I can understand why they're religious, and I would n- never. Yeah, I, I never attempted to tell my um, aged mother, you know, in her 90s that all her beliefs were up the creek, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, ask no. it from Hitchens, pers- yeah. Hitchens' perspective. Does it poison everything? No, it doesn't poison everything. Um, it's necessary for some people. It's, um, there are many different types of religion. I mean, we're talking, yeah, if you're talking here about organised, yeah, um, mm-hmm. Religions that we, yeah, we have in the Western countries. Um, this is only one type of, one form or expression of religion. There are many other forms of religion which don't have anything like any of these, yeah, mm. uh, structures around them. And it's, but it's still the same, yeah, religious thinking behind it all. There are different types of religious thinking, but no, it's, it's just the way people are. Um, I used to be quite antagonistic towards Christianity, I'd <laughs> to, but then I realised, oh, hang on, hang on, no, um, I was, I was sincere, yeah, it did, it, I got some good things out of it as well as a lot of bad, um, yeah, I just got to accept responsibility for what I've done um, mm. and uh, move on and I see other people the same way, yeah, okay, you're where you're at, I was where I was at <laughs> and it's not for me to judge, you know. Mm-hmm you're at now if they go if their religion takes them into um denials of other people's rights then that's becomes another issue yeah. something quite different um mm-hmm. but as far as i i mean when I, when I read biblical studies uh books you know you see the bi- religious bias and you i get impatient with it and i think well, this is all rubbish it's all a waste of uh yeah print <laughs> waste of uh and I think, okay, so, but okay, that's where people are at. That's what they're doing. They're playing with their own myths. It's their own world. And okay, I'll set up my blog and I'll try to tell them my point of view that, okay, well, why believe in myths? Well, yeah, not necessary. Well, could I, 
let me um, take it to a little subset of the question, maybe. Do you see religion as psychologically abusive towards children, especially Christianity? And I could, if, if that's not um, yeah, yeah. really clear, I, I, can, think, I can definitely elaborate I think, a little bit. I think parents can be psychologically abusive, but I, I see religion is simply an abstract entity, really. Um, religion doesn't do any of these things. It's people that do these things. And, right. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I, I know people who you know, are trying to bring their kids up with an openness, you know, that they let kids decide for themselves, you know, at a certain age and other parents take them to different religions. I know mm -hmm. one who uh, takes his daughter to uh, a mosque and then to, you know, one day and to a Christian church on another day. And uh, I think it's because there's a mixed marriage there, but uh, right. he's not trying to force his daughter either way. Um, Better make up her own mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, what I mean I is like the the whole you're yeah. you're wicked, you're you're sinful, uh, you're nothing. People, yeah, people are sincere, and you can't hold that against them. And people really sincerely believe it. Um, and I mean, what can you do? You can't. Okay, can you tell them? Okay, well, that's a wicked thing. Yeah, you you sincerely believe that you're doing the best thing possible. Yeah, your family or your child. Uh, I mean, where do you start with that? Well, yeah. I think simply uh, education. You try to do what you can to make other ideas available, but you can't sit someone down and say, "Look, I know you're sincere. I know you really believe this, but here's why you're wrong." <laughs> okay, yeah. where's it, where are you going to start? Um, I hear you. I, hear you. I, I think my concern is is yeah. is the whole idea that um, if if you do what you you mentioned your friend does, where he, you know exposes yeah. to, you know a, a daughter to different ideas, let her make up her own mind. I definitely have a little bit more um, respect for that. I would say, um, yeah. but I think my concern is it's and maybe it's about the kind of Christianity because then it was different brands of Christianity, but the kind of Christianity that I was exposed to was very much. Um, we have the right message. Everyone yeah. else is 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 going to hell, um, and even even other Christians they might not be going to hell because they're Christians, but they're 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 kind of wasting their life because they're not doing it our yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you end up with this whole system where, you know, people that hopefully you know kind of wake up sometimes in their twenties or thirties, or in my case, I'm late bloomer in my forties. You wake up yeah. and you think I wasted so much of my time on something that wasn't yeah. real, and the idea yeah. is that no one, no one tells you. Hey, this this might be real, but if we're wrong, you know, explore your options. You pick what's best for you. They they phrase it, frame it as, this is the only truth, and and yeah. we alone yeah. have it. And we might have little tweaks to make, but with the core is real, and it's yeah. it's not just real, but it's it's like life and death eternally real. I guess that just it just or concern it, puts, yeah. it hurts my heart to th think of that. Yeah. Okay, but the many of the ordinary people, adults who think that that's how they were brought up. Yeah. It's, it's an endless cycle. I mean, where, do, yeah, where, do the, where does uh, personal responsibility come in? The ones I, I'm not thinking so much of parents, the ones I think who uh, really have a lot to answer for are those who do run the religions. You know, I'm thinking of the Armstrongs, yeah. um, um, those cults, yeah, okay, now, uh, surely they and other people around them had to see yeah. what was really going on and many people did see what was going on and they did publish it but we're kept, you know that information is kept from us um yeah now that's where the real yeah crime is you know it's denying people the information so they can be fully accountable or responsible yeah, mm. for what they're doing. yeah it's a and, great point um when it comes to parents yeah um how do you attack, I don't know, where, where you start, I think it's just education, I suppose, I've always, I suppose, with my background in education, um, I've always seen this, the only hope, really, is uh, education, putting ideas, making, yeah, trying to advance ideas, yeah. make them available, so people, when they do get to an age, they can think for themselves and, yeah, question mm. things, uh, well, many of them, but, uh, but people... Don't do it until there's a certain time in their life. Usually, it's a crisis or some particular event and that happens to them that makes them, you know, puts them in a position where they do start to question. Until that happens, um, 
I don't know what you can do. Yeah. On that note, do you have people that, you know, do engage you in conversation about your beliefs and do you, do you find a lot of people are willing to, you know, they're Christians that are you know, believers, that they're willing to listen to the other side of the, the arguments, or do you find most people are closed-minded and it's just not worth going there, or how do you? I, I, I don't think it's worth going. I, I know people have at times, you know, they've, I asked one Christian, I said, yeah, at work, she said, yeah, she really liked me, and I said, yeah, yeah, you're a Christian. You know, I'm an atheist. <laughs> Why do you, yeah, respond in these ways? Just, oh, I know, but you were a Christian, and I still know some of that Christian goodness is still in you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you just uh, can't win. <laughs> yes. I think, uh, why bother? Why bother? Yeah, people are where they're at. You know, I, I know how I was, and anyone tried to tell me differently. Um, yeah. Wasting their time, and no, no, I, I think um, no, people have got to make up their own minds in their own time and usually it does and some people just never do they go to their graves in a certain way well hmm. uh, i think as a human species as a human race the best we can do all we can do really is uh yeah put ideas and uh, make information as available as possible yeah well i appreciate that um advice i wanted to ask to kind of wrap us up with with focusing on on the people that are are kind of thinking through these issues for the first time I know for, for, and when I say these issues, I mean the, the, the questions of, you know, maybe Christianity is not what I thought it was. Maybe the origins of it, you know, I didn't know, you know, a, a thousandth of what I should have been told about where it came from. Um, me and the implications, maybe it's not real. You know, it's the, the shake up questions, you know, this is really, you know, rattling our cages. The Christians that are in that, they're learning for the first time. They're, they're studying the mystery cults, maybe. They're studying how, you know, Luke and Acts is, is you know, copies of, from Homeric epics in some ways. They're studying all kinds of issues like this. Where maybe even just going back real far, the Yahweh character. Where did Yahweh come from? Yeah. And, and how did this religion evolve? And it's, it's kind of shaking them up. I wanted to ask kind of two questions. Could you give your best, you know, uh, advice or counsel for number one, on, a, on an academic um, educational level, what would be a good place for people to start to focus or questions to think through first? Um, and then the, the other question is more, I guess, I emotional as to, as people get sh shaken up about this and you know, they, they're like, I, I thought this was all real and it's, maybe it's not. And you know, I, I hope it's real. I hope I can go back to a, you know, a spot of, I believe and you know, I got my, I went through my shaky faith time and now I'm back to my relationship with God is strong again. Maybe they're hoping it gets there, but they're aware that it might not get back there. They're aware that some things are, are changing and it's emotionally difficult where they're just like this uh, life is life is not feeling right right now. Just any advice or counsel you give to someone that's going through those struggles and feeling like this is, you know, like you say, it was, it was very, um, yeah, yeah. it felt like uh -oh. the weight was lifted, but to them, they're, they're still in the spot where it's hurting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the first one, um, don't follow any one author or person. You know? I often uh, get asked uh, what I think of something. And I think, why ask me? I mean, my ideas are changing all the time, you know. Um, yeah. so get out for yourself, explore it yourself, you know. Your ideas, answers will be different from mine. Um, and no, uh, simply explore the origins basics of everything don't get completely yeah you know, if you see someone that you like think this, this is yeah you know, one author is very good this is sums it all up make sure you read yeah you know, criticisms or alternative viewpoints and just yeah get to know you know what the scholarship the respected scholarship does say but from even the scholarship though there'll be different perspectives yeah you know? get a thorough grounding on that and as far as the uh, yeah as far as the emotional side God, everyone goes through it themselves. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it was traumatic, but, and um, I think, yeah, I think I said, I, I what if I wanted to murder someone? I think when I did become an atheist, one of the first things I knew I wanted to do was <laughs> I did want to kill someone. <laughs> um, I thought, oh my God, now I'm an atheist. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a murderer. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, um, no, it, it, just take a bit of time, yeah, work through it. Um, I found a lot of help in the books of other people who have gone through the same things, uh, people who have been through cults. You can get an awful lot of books about 
by authors discussing the churches that abuse them, mm. uh, discussing their cult experiences, and uh, just yeah, getting company by reading those, reading a lot of those. You know, you begin to realise there is hope at the end of it. Yeah, at the end of it all. Mm. Yeah. Um, just one thing I mentioned: uh, see, religion is harmless. I, I just thought afterwards, people would think about uh, terrorism. You know, Jewish and uh, Islamic. Christian terrorists now, the, you know, the white supremacists. Um, those, you, you look at the, uh, go into studying what, where those people are coming from. There's a real psychological, sociological, historical explanation there. And the religion is simply a veneer or, yeah, something that's a lay that's put on top of it. Um, it's, that's not where the religion is make, you know, people, religion doesn't come in and make people go out and, you know, throw bombs at anyone. Um, it's other factors that do that, that twist people, and they might use religion to justify their ideas, but that's something different. Yeah. I just wanted to throw that in because, you know, I can immediately hear people say, oh, what about, you know, all the violence? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good good caveat. I, I was going to say that was that was my last question, but I, I do just have one more, and that's to bring in what we talked about before we started, before we hit the record button. Um, could you just speak to the uh, just the need for for those of us who are in this studying it, those of us who are on your side who are, do, are doing a lot of the production, who are doing a lot of the digging and the research and the citing of this and that, and going to the sources, and those of us like myself who are just kind of the you know the recipients who are trying to figure out what's what and catch up with you all who are many steps ahead of us who are you know you're doing the heavy lifting and we're trying to just figure out how it all what how it all fits together, but there, there's from my perspective, when you get into this, the spot where you're, you're really trying to figure out where did this Christianity thing come from, and you get exposed to things like mythicism and versus, you know, historicism, and you get exposed to issues like, um, you know, Roman provenance, did Rome have anything to do with this? You get exposed to Israel only, you get exposed to astrotheology, you know, it's all Jesus is just a sun god, nothing else. And you get all these different things. You get, you know, people saying Jesus was an archangel, you know, crucified up in space. No, he wasn't. And just so many different arguments. And I, I feel like one of the biggest needs that we have is, is it possible to, to, to borrow a Christian concept, so to speak, is to bring some grace to our, our conversation. I see a lot of um, caustic conversations, um, you know, in some of the groups that, that um, I, I'm, I'm exposed to. And I, I feel like one of the best things that we can do to help people that are on the outside looking in saying, hey, what are you all talking about? Is to say, you know what, we, we have the ability to be, you know, adults about this and to say, you know, we have diff different agreements. You know, I talked to Neil and he, he thinks this about this and I study this person, that person's the complete opposite. And just to be able to say, you know what, we, we can be all have a, a, a a tone of respect for each other to be, you know, if we were physically in the same spot, I know most of us aren't, but if we're in the same spot, we could have a little bit of a heated argument and then go out for a drink when we're done and be friends when it's over. And could you just speak to, you know, maybe anything you could add to that to, to just to, to encourage our groups to, to be more friendly and civil with each other? We're all human. That's all. No, we're all human. Uh, we're all, yeah, all had our experiences. This is where we're at. Each of us is the result of, yeah, our past experiences. And, yeah, it's um, it doesn't help anyone to attack any, uh, go on, on attacks. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, to me, it's you don't need advice on that. That's just obvious. <laughs> yeah. People who um, uh, engage in that sort of, yeah, attacking, I think, Okay, they just need to go and take a cold shower and but leave the room for a while. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. To me, I, I um, there's also okay. No, I can't psychoanalyze them. I've tried to psychoanalyze some of them. <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, I wonder if maybe some of them have a Trump syndrome. You know, they've got to always be right. Yeah, the smartest, and uh, everyone else is wrong. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's a bit of narcissism there, perhaps. But uh, yeah, um, no, just yeah, you know, I, I just leave the room when those people start shouting. And, you know? <laughs> yeah, good advice. Yeah. Good advice. No, I, no, I, I, to me, um, no, I've got. You can't advise people to be good. I mean, people <laughs> are what they are. So yeah. Yeah. I definitely, I think it's, it's, it's a, I don't know, a passion or it's at least on my heart to 
okay. just for us, for us, for our, 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 the circles that we travel and to be inviting to other people to, for them to come in and say, huh, these are, these are some good people. These are some good people. Not, Hey, these are some, some jerks who like to, you know, cut yeah. each other down. And I know it's, there's no way you can, you can't avoid the, the snarkiness. Some people that's just, that's where they go to, but yeah. I would love to in, be more inviting with our, our groups. And I, I hope it yeah. can happen. I, 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 I've, corresponded with a number of uh, scholars, biblical and others, you know, and uh, discussed things with them, you know, not just, you know, biblical things, but, uh, no, and we get along very well, you know, uh, many of us. That's but great. The online, um, some of them, they just, they just lie. They just insult and they lie, you know, they just, and uh, even in their scholarly papers, they sometimes just outright lie and uh, I presume because they're in a scholarly journal people won't check it up they'll take that as oh that must be true um well yeah now what can you do so and atheists yeah there's an atheist uh, group here in australia and i basically got uh hounded out because uh i had questions that were in favor of mythicism and then i hear someone in america uh who had the opposite, uh, all the atheists chucked him out of their group because um, he wasn't a mythicist. <laughs> so, uh, to me, it's not atheism. It's just, yeah, you, in some parts of the world, people you get more jerks in a group than you do in other parts. That's it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, this is the world, yeah. Does Australia seem a little bit more secular than, like, uh, oh, yeah. Britain or America? I don't know so much about Britain, but we're probably closer to Britain, but certainly much more. Yeah, second than America. No, Americans, um, I know. <laughs> it's funny when you grow up in America, you don't know how different the rest were. You just you just think that you know there's yeah. good Christians everywhere, and they're all like us probably, yeah. and you don't realize how Baptists. Baptists. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. all good good fundamental yeah. Baptists, and you yeah. don't realize that there's some people that are even Christians around the world that are, have a very different perspective and worldview, um, yeah. even though they might claim to follow Christ, and it's it is interesting to. To, to get that education, like, huh, I'm in a very, oh, yeah. very it's, weird yeah, subculture. Yeah, yeah, no, just uh, traveling overseas, working overseas at different times, you know, you see Christians, you know, how they conduct, do things different from Christians back home, you know, and you're, you know, it's even within the same religion, you know, there's, there are differences in how they um, practice things and, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, and and anthropology. I just read so much. Yeah, ex explored just um, human cultures, the human mind. You know why? Yeah, how people are so completely different in different cultures, and what is this human animal? Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Anyway. Well, I, I just appreciate your being uh, willing to uh, meet with me today, Neil. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, everyone, again, uh, we're chatting with Neil Godfrey uh, of the uh, website Freedar. Am I pronouncing that right? Freedar? Yeah, and, confuse uh, me. <laughs> Freedar. I and uh, I yeah. just appreciate, again, everyone, please go to his, his site, check out his blog. There's a lot there. You're, you're not going to be able to get through everything. I haven't gotten through everything, but there's a lot there. You'll probably find something that, that uh, strikes your fancy and what you want to read more about and dig deeper into. Um, I've done that many times over the last year, and I've done that a lot recently in preparation for this interview. But I just I appreciate your all your expertise, your willingness to collaborate with so many great people and to get some information that a lot of us otherwise wouldn't know how to get. Uh, but thank you so much for, for your voice and in, in all this, for the mythicist stuff, for the atheist stuff. And um, I look forward to seeing you know what, what's next down the line. And um, just thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you. Enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you so much.